Okay. Again, welcome. Um, if you're joining us in Zoom, thank you for, for making it on time and, and, and getting into the, uh, the interactive format here. Um, we're gonna have some, some opportunities for some Q&A through the chat box um, at the end of the webinar. It is uh, Southwest Wildfire Awareness Week. So we're really excited to share this information this week when we're all thinking about wildfire risk in the Southwest. Um, so please help us kind of amplify that message and share this webinar um, with your friends and family on Facebook if, if you um, are on social media. Um, I'll start off with just a brief introduction um, before we get rolling here. Um, my name is Gabe Kohler. Um, I work with an organization called the Forest Stewards Guild. Um, we're a non-governmental organization that practices and promotes forestry that is ecologically, socially, and economically responsible. And so this webinar is made possible by the Fire Adapted New Mexico Learning Network in partnership with our agency partners. Um, I wanna give a special thanks to New Mexico Bureau of Land Management for supporting this webinar, the Santa Fe, Cibola, and Carson National Forests, New Mexico State Forestry, the National Park Service, as well as many local governments, non-governmental organizations, and fire departments across the state. Um, and now, I'd like to kind of transition into discussing our webinar topic for today. Um, very excited to have our speaker with us today. Um, our conversation today will focus on resident mitigation. So kind of at that property owner or renter or resident level. Um, and we're focusing on before the fire today. So this is a component of a fire adapted community. We really wanna, um, you know, make sure that we all understand how to get prepared before a fire at our home scale. Um, and we're excited to have um, Megan Fitzgerald McGowan with us today. Um, Megan coordinates the FireWise program um, and is a great resource to us today. And FireWise is one of the best programs that supports residents in preparing for wildfire at that before the fire level. And so we're really lucky to have her on today. Um, the NFPA is the organization that is responsible for creating FireWise and the home ignition zone principles that are often shared out um, through organizations like the, the network. We share out tons of home ignition zones resources um, and we're really happy to have that resource from the NFPA, um, which is the National Fire Protection Association. Um, and so that's a little bit about our conversation today. Um, Here's a little bit, I like to share this just because it helps kind of situate what we're talking about today within the broader fire adapted communities framework. But um, as you can see here, there are many parts of a fire adapted communities or a fire adapted community, everything from recovery uh, to, which is after the fire, we have safety and evacuation during the fire. Um, and today we're gonna be focusing on resident mitigation, which is before the fire and focused on that resident scale. Um, and so this is kind of where we're at today. And um, if you'd like to learn more about these other components, please you know, stay in touch with the Learning Network. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about how you can prepare your home and property, please get connected with Megan Fitzgerald McGowan or your local FireWise organization because there are many FireWise organizations across the state. Um, cool. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Megan Fitzgerald McGowan from the NFPA. Um, Megan, would you please um, unmute yourself and um, introduce yourself? Well, hello, everyone. My name is Megan, and like Gabe said, I'm with the National Fire Protection Association. I'm going to pop up my slides because I have, well, probably some other things to say about myself, but, uh, you know, the slides help me remember those. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the home ignition zone and how we can better prepare for wildfires. A little bit about me, I am a former wildland firefighter myself. I've spent many years out um, on assignments helping to protect communities. And you know, finally, at the end of the day, I wanted to transition to something a little more proactive instead of just coming in there to try to, to protect these homes on, 
from the fire when it's happening, what can we do um, beforehand to help improve the situation to make it safer for those residents who live there, make it safer for the firefighters responding? And ultimately, is there a way that we can reduce that potential destruction? Um, I'm a huge advocate for collaborative approaches, so I'm so honored to be a part of the network today. Um, I love seeing state and local networks that are bringing folks together to learn from each other, share with each other, and really leverage that local knowledge. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to show you is from kind of the national perspective. Gabe was kind enough to share a previous presentation that had been done so I could incorporate some photos from New Mexico. Otherwise, you'll probably be seeing some that are from Colorado, which is where I live and some different pine settings and different home settings, but um, really local is best, I think, for sharing success stories and challenges and how you overcome those. So it's great to see so many folks on the call. And then um, we're not really talking about the FireWise USA program today, but I just wanna say, you know, not only do I talk about this, do I preach it, but, but I live it. I live in a FireWise site myself here in Colorado Springs. Uh, I'm in the foothills surrounded by oak brush and pine trees and, we're finally, I think the weather's settling down where we can start to get out there and, and pick up things from the winter so we can be ready for the, the spring and summer fire season. Um, as Gabe said, I work for the National Fire Protection Association. For those of you who aren't aware of us, NFPA is a global self-funded nonprofit that was established in 1896. We are devoted to eliminating death, injury, property, and economic loss due to fire, electrical, and related hazards. A lot of what we're known for are codes and standards. That's a big part of our, our operation and what we do. Um, but we also offer lots of resources around public education and outreach. We do trainings and certifications. And within Wildfire, we have some different things that we offer. I'm gonna to move something real quick on my screen. So um, within NFPA, I do work in our Wildfire Division. We're a small but mighty team. And our goal here is to provide resources to residents and key influencers to help ensure that everyone living at risk from wildfire has what they need to, to take action. And when we talk about wildfire and the fire adopted communities kind of wheel there that Gabe showed, our focus really is on that built environment and the, the idea of the home admission zone. So what can we do to help residents be empowered to take action on around their own home and property to play their role in solving the wildfire problem? Um, some objectives of what I hope we're going to cover um, in today's discussion is kind of what is this FireWise vision, not so much from the program, but really kind of in a broader sense and the home ignition zone, how that term came about. We'll go through some basic fire behavior, um, looking at, you know, what influences how fire spreads, the elements of combustion, and I'll, there's other resources we can point you to if you want to take a really a, a deeper dive, but I think basic understanding can help us as we talk about then within the home ignition zone, what actions are most effective. Uh, we're going to identify some primary sources of ignition, and then we'll just walk through, walk through the home ignition zone from the home all the way out to 100 feet and beyond. So when we talk about the FireWise vision and this whole idea of, of residents doing work around their home, it's stemmed from this idea that wildland fires can occur in areas of residential development without the occurrence of disasters loss. And we've seen instances of this where when people are able to do the right things in the right place, they do make it through a wildfire. And so, you know, we're just constantly seeking to get that knowledge and information out there to help people take action. Um, that idea stems into that, in fact, the house and its surrounding community can be compatible with the area's ecosystem. And a little bit further in the presentation, I'll be sharing some videos of folks who, who took different actions around their home and property, changing up the way their landscape looked, altering their home, and they made it through a fire when others in their community didn't. And uh, it's so hard to have those discussions, but to, to see that the work can pay off, I think, is really valuable and, and gives us that positive learning to take away. Uh, the idea of FireWise and the home ignition zone, it's all based in science. It's not something we just made up along the way. A lot of the research stemmed from the work by Dr. Jack Cohen. He's retired. He was with the U.S. Forest Service. And through different experiments that he did, uh, building structures and lighting off sections of forest near them, um, he came to these conclusions that fire does not engulf everything in its path. It only advances to locations that meet the requirements of combustion and that by altering the type, size, quantity, and spacing of vegetation and other fuels, including structures, um, that we can reduce that likelihood of combustion. 
His work has been continued on by many and a partner of ours that we work with quite a bit is the research, um, is the Entrance Institute for Business and Home Safety or IBHS. They have a lot of really great videos um, that are out there from their lab where they've looked at homes, shooting embers at them and how they ignite. NFP has also partnered with them on some different handouts that are available for free around the science of you know, looking at decks or vents, um, different things and, and how fire impacts those. So uh, a lot of great stuff there. And like I said, this is all based in science. It's not just things that we made up on a whim. So the idea of the home ignition zone, that whole concept is that the home materials and immediate surroundings dictate its ignitability. And then what happens in this area is critical to the structure survival. And there are things we can do to prevent home ignitions. A little bit about some basic fire behavior. We have here the fire behavior triangle. So the things that we see on the ground influencing how a fire, a wildfire spreads are um, weather, topography, and fuel. So on the weather side, the temperature, humidity, winds, slope for topography, uh, you know, where a home is positioned on the slope or within a canyon can definitely impact its susceptibility to um, kind of wildfire spread. But the main things that we control that we like to talk about are the fuels, because um, that's what we can control. So potential fuels in a wildfire are living in dead vegetation, homes and outbuildings. And you can see there what the flammability depends on. But these are the three things that firefighters are looking at when they're evaluating a wildfire. And so uh, from that resident perspective, it's kind of looking at, you know, if you have the opportunity to build new, kind of where are you going to put your home in relation to the slope? but most of us don't have that opportunity. So it's keeping slope in mind. What are the fuels within your, your home ignition zone that you can control, that you can manage, and what can you do specifically to your house? Talking a little bit about how homes ignite and how fire spreads, we have these different um, ideas of heat transfer. So the first one is radiation. And that's the heat energy released in all directions from a burning object. So if we're talking about like a wildfire, uh, we're looking at the heat that moves ahead of the flames to, um, to heat other, other fuels above and ignite them. Okay, um, the next type of heat transfer is convection. And con this is, you know, the transfer of heat by the movement of rising hot air or gases. And this is where we see those embers, embers coming aloft. And in a couple of slides, we'll talk about the three main ways that homes ignite, but embers are a huge deal. And I know Gabe mentioned that uh, the, the network has spoken about those this year and last year. NFPA continues to push out this idea of how do we protect our homes against embers um, when we look at post-fire science. That seems to be one of the main causes of home ignitions. We'll, we'll see homes that, that burn, and yet they're surrounded by trees that didn't ignite. And it's these embers that are floating aloft, finding receptive beds to land in, skunk around and eventually ignite. And then, you know, they just, they burn until they, they can take a, a hold of something else. And, and that's how that home will, will ignite. The final heat transfer is conduction. This is pretty straightforward. The process by which heat is transferred through direct contact. So that could be those surface flames that are moving through an area when we talk about the home ignition zone, you know, if you have grass and brush leading right up to the house, that's where you're going to see that fire spread right up to it, burn, smolder, and potentially ignite the home through that direct connection. And then we already touched on embers, but, you know, the, the three main types of ignition sources in terms of the fire itself, we've got crown fires sweeping through. That really come, we talk about, we touch on that and how to prevent that with the extended part of the home ignition zone when you're 30 to 100 feet out or even further looking at the landscape surrounding a whole community, uh, those, those ideas of thinning projects, shaded field breaks, trying to break up that canopy so you don't have that crown fire burning through. Um, surface fires, again, those flames coming directly to the home or embers. Quick video and this might be redundant. I did want to say up front, you know, for those who have been in presentations where we talk about how homes ignite and the home ignition zone, the science there isn't really changing. What, what we knew 15, 20 years ago is still, still the same. However, 
we're really um, getting a lot more in terms of like learning from these fires and how homes are igniting and that, that destruction is occurring is it's the condition of the home itself in that zero to five foot space. So I just wanna put that out there. If some of this is repetitive um, from what you've seen before, yes, that's true, but it's still good information to take away to be refreshed on because it's easy to forget. So just wanted to put that out there real quick, um, but let's learn a little bit about embers and how they You see here, there was a reception of the home, probably some park, vegetation, these embers land, and they're able to eventually that more. This particular the house has good sightings. So it's starting to see fire that was on the ground ignite. Skip to the next one, but I think sometimes it's easy to forget like just those little things that can make a big difference. And uh, some presentations I've been at earlier this March really hit again on embers. We uh, There was a firefighter when I was at a conference in California who shared live video from when his crew was responding. And it was just an ember shower coming and blowing through the area, just finding those little pockets of fuel. So, you know, we, we tend to harp on that, but that's what we're seeing out there on the ground. So just wanna make sure that uh, Ember awareness is, is key, and those are the things within the home admissions, and especially at the home and zero to five foot level we're trying to address. So now that we've gone through some of those basics with wildfire behavior, and I know it was quick, and it wasn't a whole lot, there are a lot of really great resources out there. We have a whole half hour self-guided module that I can share with Gabe um, and any follow-up notes or drop in the chat later that if you wanna learn about that basic behavior more, uh, you, can, you can walk through that self-paced course. Um, just an overhead shot of what we're going to be touching on now. The most important areas for those individuals to, to address are the home, the home materials, that five, first five feet, and then working their way out. So the home, you know, when I go out and look at communities or speak with folks on the phone, there's all kinds of interesting things out there. And within your community, if you're, if you're helping residents or if you're a resident yourself looking at your neighbors, it probably runs the spectrum of what types of homes and in condition that, that they are. So we have this pretty pristine, um, very nice home in the woods with a lot of rock, metal roof. And then we've got, a, got another one that maybe needs a little bit of help, a um, little bit of extra trees and vegetation growing there. And I'd say most homes are probably somewhere in the middle. They have some strengths about them, but then they definitely have some, some weaknesses that could be improved upon. And when I talk about um, the home and the home ignition zone, let's go back and where to start. I really like to look at the, the house itself first and work, work my way down from the top to the bottom. So roofing, the roof can definitely be our, our number one spot to address if it's not, if it's not class A. It's, it's your widest surface area. It likes to collect all that debris from the surrounding vegetation. And when we do have a fire come through, that's where those embers are gonna blow. So if you are trying to think about, you know, around your home, what are some things you can do? That's the first place I would look is, what does my roof look like? Is there any damage from maybe a winter storm, a windstorm, anything like that? Do I have a collection of debris starting to build up that I can get up and clear off or have someone come help me clear off? Um, if you have that older roof or that damaged roof, trying to replace it with class A materials. And I'll show a video soon um, from a gentleman in California these things can be expensive and they take time, but they make, they make a difference. So roof is where I like to start as we look at that process. Um, working our way down, I don't know the role of gutters in New Mexico. I know some of these house features vary across the country. We're looking at some, I'm looking at homes in another state right now and not a lot of the houses have gutters, but if you do, it's keeping them maintained. 
keeping them clear. If you have anything else that's attached to your roof, it's you just want to you want to keep it clean and keep it clear. Um, we've definitely seen fires in the past where that debris that's built up has been that source of ignition for that home. And once you get a, a home or two igniting in a community, it's really tough for the responding resources to to do much. So that's where we like to start working our way down. Vents. Um, vents are a big thing these days, trying to keep those embers from going through. So we recommend, and IBHS recommends, one eighth metal mesh screening to help block embers from penetrating into the home. There are different commercial products available, and um, maybe some others can share in the chat if they've used any of those, what they are. I'm not allowed to promote individual products, but please know that there are commercial products available, and I've heard good things from some of our program participants that have installed them and made it through a fire and really felt that those vents helped to make a difference. Other things when we're looking at the home, we wanna consider the siding and the windows. So does that siding go all the way down to the ground? What material is the home made of? Um, some of the very nice pictures that Gabe was able to share with me, it's more of that kind of stucco adobe look. So maybe not as much wood, but depending on what you have, that cement foundation at the bottom, um, having some space there, having a gap can make a difference. And keeping it, keeping it in good repair, making sure you don't have cracks, you don't have any pieces missing, all those things, windows, double paned, all of that. And again, some of these home projects, when we talk about things to tackle, they, they are expensive. Um, so when you're evaluating your home, it's just making that list, prioritizing and setting yourself some goals. Not everything can be done at once. And you might have to start with some easier projects first, but those little things also make a difference. So we'll continue to discuss what some of those are as we go along. Another big area of focus of conversation is around decks. What are the decks made of? Combustible versus non-combustible? Are they in good repair? Solid versus open construction? Enclose, enclose if you can. So kind of at the bottom of this deck here that we're seeing, um, something that we would recommend is, is screening that in because as it sits right now, debris is gonna get blown under there to just kind of sit and collect. And if the debris blows under there, the embers are gonna blow under there. And that could be that potential ignition source for your home is the stuff under your deck, then igniting your deck if it's made of wood. Um, when I look at my deck here where I live, again, surrounded by pine trees, we get, we get pine needles that build up in the cracks and get stuck over the support beams that are made of wood. The deck itself is not. So I have to go through and clear out those, rake underneath, all those things. Other things, if you have a nice big raised deck, it's really handy for storage, but please don't do it. Or at least not in your state's prime kind of wildfire season. Um, so, you know, whether that's the spring or summer, that's when you want to get that that wood material, like the picture here where we've got some, oh, some different planks and some, looks like some sort of plywood. Um, you wanna move those things out. I think right now for, for my deck, I've got some metal chairs, I'm not so much worried about them igniting, but there's leaves that have piled up around them from the winter time. So I have to go through and clean out those, but I have a colleague who used to call all this stuff human treasures. So as much as you can, please don't store your human treasures under your deck. Another big thing that we're seeing within communities um, are fences and it's fences can be a part of the house. They can also be further out within the home ignition zone, but really uh, where they attach to the house can, it can be a vulnerable point. So we have um, on one side here, a wood fence attaching directly to the side of a house. Now, again, the house itself is made of more fire resistant material but it's really good practice to try to create that separation between the wood and the structure. So to the right, we have that wood fence attaching to some cinder blocks and those are right next to the house to create that non-combustible barrier. Um, we have, IBHS has reported some of the fires that they've gone to look at, how those fences can really serve as a wick within the community. Um, so again, that's, that's more further out in the home ignition zone, but just kind of keep that in mind what did the fences in your community look like? Do people have brush right up against them to help create more privacy? Um, some different things that you might want to, to address as you prepare for wildfire season. Um, so those are some, some different things talking about the home. 
And like I said, we do get these questions of, well, that's a lot of money. Is it really worth it to do this? And from my standpoint, yes. And from the standpoint of Mark and Susan Almer, some, some friends of mine that I've made in the last year or so who live in one of our fireway sites in California, that work really matters. They live in Grizzly Flats. It's up in the mountains east of San Francisco. And last year they were impacted by the Caldor fire. The community itself, before the fire had over 600 homes in it, and after the fire, there's around 200 left. Um, they are a firewise community. Their fire safe council was active within the community trying to share information to varying degrees of receptiveness to flat out, get off my property, don't talk to me, I'm not gonna do any of this. Um, but Mark and Susan and some of their neighbors and friends really tried to be that inspiration and that lead within the community. And uh, he shared what we had a chance to go out and visit and he shared with us that over the last 15 years, they they just were doing the work as they could. Um, at one point, they replaced their roof, switching from, I think they had asphalt shingles to metal. They replaced their deck. They had a big wraparound deck and they, they shrunk its footprint to smaller off the back end. We'll see it, I think, in a picture um, and, and worked in some cement. They replaced those vents over time as they could, and then they really focused on clearing within that zero to five foot space and working their way out to 100 feet. So I'm going to share um, Mark in his own words, kind of talking about what he sees as important. None, never replacing this roof. Mm -hmm. I know for, for some people, the roof I mean, the roof is the biggest surface area for embers to land yes. and can be the biggest cost to replace. But from my perspective, it's the most important thing. Would you say, as you look at all the work you guys have done around your home, is that probably the key key feature? I, I would say, yes, the, the roof and probably the decking were probably the, the two largest factors and uh, when it comes to, to building construction, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. None. So the fire that burned through Mark's community, the Caldor fire, his community was adjacent to where it started. It started on I think, August 14th and within 24 hours, it blew I think, through, this, through this community, uh, wind-driven fire an area that has diurnal wind patterns. So in the morning it blows from one direction and in, in the evening it switches 180 degrees and, and the wind comes from the other direction. So the fire passed through multiple times and some houses made it through the first round and then didn't necessarily on the second. And so that was influenced what we talked about earlier with that fire behavior triangle, you know, the weather and the topography within the community and how winds were channeled and flames were channeled. Um, when he talks about his roof and his deck, I'll have another video here, but right now there's pine needles and stuff that's scattered, but before they left, they picked it all up. And when they came back, they, they found embers that landed on all these things, but because there wasn't flammable materials for those embers to latch onto, that's what helped them to make it through. And his home itself did not have uh, suppression resources intervene. Some of the other Homes within his kind of cul-de-sac did, um, and they, they made it through, but the work they've done gave those resources a chance. So here we have just kind of, you can see what's left of the deck and then how they used cement to create a nice buffer between vegetation and their house. And we'll talk about that with that zero to five foot space in a second. One more quick. Before we evacuated, I went through and cleaned the areas where typically I see needles collecting in a windstorm. Because I knew that wherever they collect, firebrands will also mm -hmm. collect. And I learned that from one of the, the videos that we've seen um, done on YouTube where they have ember generators yeah. and it shows, yep, where they're being, uh, where the embers collect. So I was very careful as to make sure where the, um, the leaves collect, then I need to really pay attention to that uh, part and remove the, all the debris out of there, the combustible debris. That's so awesome to hear. When I, when I have conversations with folks, that's one of the points I make is like, where, where do you always find the leaves piled around your yeah. home? 
that's where you really need to do the work right. and it's throughout the year right yeah. it's never a one and done it's yeah. It's maintenance throughout the year. You get a windstorm, things drop. Okay, you go out and you pick it up again. It's one of the places over here, um, and, and it's probably not a really good example now because it was in here before we. Well, Mark goes on to show some other things, um, but the tour we did with him was so impactful for my colleague and I because it really validated the things that we talk about that all of you probably talk about and. It just really helped to, to drive some of those points home. Um, we have a lot more information that we hope to get out from our tour there. And if any of you want to learn more, hear more of Mark's story, I'm always happy to share. But I am going to move on just in the interest of time. Um, you know, after we look at the home, the next thing that we and IBHS, again, our friends at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, who are doing a lot of this post-fire research and who are testing different things in their lab, um, the next area is that zero to five foot space from the base of the home or the base of the deck or the base of your patio and really how that needs to be as combustible free as you can make it or tolerate it. Um, all of the points that we're sharing are recommendations. My program isn't regulatory. Nothing I'm doing telling you is a must, but it's, it's what the science supports. So if we look at this house, we'll go back one here, uh, we can see that they've really made use of gravel around their home. They have it kind of more open and natural. So they have that nice buffer of zero to five foot space. So they're not gonna have surface flames carry right up to the home. Um, but you know, what are some things to look out for? A colleague of mine, this was one of his favorite slides to use. And I haven't seen a ton of this when, when I was, I never saw a ton of this when I was out on fires, but, but sometimes you would. My grandparents certainly in the wintertime would stack up all their firewood along their back deck to create a wall. So it was easy to access and easy to grab. Um, but by the summertime, you definitely want to be want to be moving some of this out a little further from the home. You know, again, that idea of moving the firewood, you can see it's right by the house. And, and that's not a ton. And maybe it's not a huge concern, but what if you had some other plants there, or you can see some leaves are gathering behind that firewood. And again, where those leaves and other debris gather is where those embers are gonna go. So moving it out of that five foot space, getting it further away from the home is gonna help you be more successful. Um, another thing, and I'm sorry for the scale of these pictures, is just looking at the vegetation. You know, that zero to five foot space ideally we won't have anything, but if we're going to, we want it to be green, healthy, maintained, small. Um, you know, nothing, nothing is worse than seeing those giant shrubs right up against a house with, oh, last year's dead leaves collected underneath, dead branches, all the stuff that's blown in from, from other plants or maybe garbage that those are the areas we really want to focus on. You know, if you have a, a couple hours on a weekend, it's going to, to look at that, maybe trim it up, maintain it, make sure it's nice and clear. Uh, we talked about the importance of not having anything directly under your deck, but your deck should also be kind of treated like, um, like your home and have that zero to that, that five feet out from it. So when I look at this picture, the brush that's underneath, um, I'd like to see a wider, a wider strip between kind of if the deck went all the way down to the ground, that line that you'd see and where the vegetation starts. Because again, you're gonna get that radiant heat, that convective heat coming off of plants like that. So trying to keep that clear. And again, it is balanced too. I know uh, sometimes lot size and home size um, are not always proportional. So you're also trying to balance privacy from your neighbors, different things like that. But as much as you can do at the home in zero to five foot space to keep it clear and keep it clean, you're gonna be setting yourself up for a greater chance of success. After we get out of that zero to five foot space, we can start to have a little bit more within our property. Um, you know, it used to be kind of referred to as the, the lean, green, and I think mean zone, but really that's what it is. It's you want minimal vegetation, stuff that's green and healthy, stuff that's maintained, or that use of more xeriscaping or natural landscaping. Um, you can see in the picture here, they have some different, some different trees, different vegetation, but they also have that rock underneath. It's very clean, very open. 
the use of rock pavers to kind of create that, that natural barrier um, that ties into this idea of hardscaping. So you can also use features like driveways and walkways to break up vegetation because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to stop that fuel, that constant fuel spread, that uh, availability for, for surface fire to carry all the way up to the home. Just another couple of pictures looking at some of that natural and created um, barriers to establish space, making use of the road. You know, uh, on the left, we see some grass around there, but it's pretty low key. It's not too tall. Um, there's some different things that could be, could be cleaned up. But overall, when we look around the base of the home, it's pretty clear. And those are the types of things that we're striving for. In this area, we also really want to focus on removing any ladder fuels from underneath maybe those, those trees or um, mature kind of brush and bushes that we want to keep. So it's about pruning, it's about clearing, clearing smaller things out. And that might be work that you have to do every year or every couple of years. Um, I'm sure it's been shared in one conversation of another or another, but living in a wildfire area, it's, it's a journey, it's a lifestyle. It's never a one and done, there's always work to do. Um, so again, it's going out, kind of taking that inventory and just lining up your projects and as time allows, tackling them. Uh, just more hitting on that idea of maintenance. If you have something that's kind of decadent, overgrown, you can see all the leaves that have collected in it. You wanna pull all that debris out. You wanna trim stuff up. You wanna give it space. Again, just another example in that five to 30 foot zone, creating space between the different trees and vegetation that are there. That way fire doesn't have that continuous path to get to your home. So it's that mix of vegetation spacing, using natural features, um, everything to break it up. One thing that we haven't really shown here, um, and I don't know how popular it is in New Mexico, but if we're looking at within our, our landscaping, you know, mulch. Um, people where I live love their bark mulch in the south, they love their pine straw. And really in that zero to five foot space, if you can get rid of it and use rock, that's great. But even further out, sometimes if you have um, large concentrations of it, again, it's that area where stuff can kind of burn and smolder and kick out embers. And we're slowly getting that message through. And I just wanna share this video um, of this homeowner who just before a fire, she made some landscaping changes and they played a big role in her homes, um, how, it, how it fared. It's pretty emotional. It's so clear when you look at it that the wood mulch burned and it stopped at the gravel. And if it hadn't been for the gravel, it would have burned right up to the edge of the house. And would it have burned the house? I don't know, but it wouldn't have been good. You know, you just, I think you just can't pretend this, is, this area is the way it was 30 years ago when it was early in its life. It, we're having wildfires now, and I think we have to change the way we think about landscape. You see the world differently once you've experienced wildfire and having to run from it. You, you see what's flammable. Uh, as a designer and contractor, I used to think about whether it was aesthetically pleasing and highly functional. But highly functional has taken on a much higher level now. Is it functional for a wildfire? The thing that has struck me over this last couple of weeks was some sense of peace that at least we tried, at least we did something, and, and as it turns out, what we did mattered. Those are some of my, my favorite stories, when the actions that people took made a difference. And, and you can see it and you can hear not only the pride in her voice, but, but just also that like thankfulness that her home survived. Um, and, and that's our goal because when it goes the opposite way, those conversations are hard and they're painful. And whatever we can do to try to avoid those is, is what we're, I think we're all about here. Um, something that was interesting from the landscaper, you know, she said she's trying to change how she looks at the landscape. It's not just what's aesthetically pleasing, but what's functional. And I have a colleague who is trying to 
in our in our different presentations gets on a soapbox and how do we change that paradigm nationwide what what we see is beauty around our homes and how we value the forest or the natural landscape where we live but is it really natural is it in balance with what what that landscape should look like in terms of how it's been managed and all those different things and and being more open to to change our perspective of what beauty is and that's that's a part of the conversation um, as we move out from that five to 30 foot space, we're really getting into more kind of vegetation management and then even extending into kind of um, kind of that landscape management, landscape resiliency. So in this area, you know, it's more of kind of tree spacing, vegetation spacing. You don't have to, it doesn't all have to go away, but it does need to be maintained um, periodically and it does need to be as healthy as it can be. So, you know, kind of 30 to 60 feet, depending on what your vegetation fuel type is, um, will dictate the spacing that you need, how far up you need to prune, and resources like the Forest Guild and, you know, other, other local partners within New Mexico, they're going to be able to give you that real specific guidance that I just can't address. This is very general, broad information here, and, but from it, they can make those kind of localized best practices to help you out. Um, but still a big thing in this area is just how do you kind of break up some of that vegetation, keep spacing so we can impact how that fire is burning and how it spreads. And just a, a final kind of note, I would be remiss as the FireWise USA program manager if I didn't touch on, it's not just you and your property and your home ignition zone, but there's a good chance that within a hundred feet of you could be your neighbor's property. And you know, the condition of their home and what their, their landscaping looks like is gonna impact you and vice versa. So really, once you start to do the work, it's connecting with your neighbors to reduce that shared risk to improve your overall footprint of mitigation on the ground to help keep all of you safer. Um, so that's kind of what I have to say about the home ignition zone. It's a lot in a short amount of time and there's so many things that could be discussed getting into the specifics of different types of projects that you can do, resources that are available. Um, but, but the biggest thing, it, it can be overwhelming to think about it to get started, but, but you, can, you can make it more achievable. So you do that 360, you kind of take that take in that inventory, make a list and prioritize actions. And that prioritization can be based on you know, what's the highest risk or what's the easiest thing to do? If you have an hour where you can get out and clean up all the leaves right around your home, that's great. That's going to really set you up for success. So it's just starting to identify those projects and take action. And then um, again, tell your neighbors, get them involved, encourage them to do the work too. I uh, just want to share some resources. Um, Gabe uh, was kind enough to let me know that there is a home hazard assessment guide available on the Fire Adapted New Mexico website. And this is really gonna be geared towards your home there in New Mexico, speaking a little bit more to your vegetation, your home building types and your resources. We also have different things available on firewise.org if you're planning different meetings and you, we have some um, how to prepare your home fact sheets and some different resources that are available for free to you as well. So thank you so much for your time. Here's some information if you wanna get a hold of NFPA, but I know we're gonna open it up for questions and I, I can see a lot of stuff in the chat. I don't know if it's comments or questions, but I'm gonna turn things back over to 